we go. Welcome, everybody. Episode number 65 of Hobby Hotline. My name is Jeremy Lee. I am joined by the DH, Drew Herndon, and we have Chris Stalegum with us. Gentlemen, how are we doing on this fine Sunday morning? Drew, what's going on? I'm doing good, man. Just hanging out. Uh, about to go do some baseball a little bit later with the little one. All right, right, right on. Coach and you, you're cutting out early, so that's why I'm I'm actually going to host the show for the first time. Happy yes. to do it. Honored to do it, guys. This is great. Chris, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing just fine. And uh, later tonight, I will be attending my first Philadelphia Union home match since uh, last year's playoff debacle. So kind of nice. excited for that. They had a big win in the Champions League against Atlanta this week. So uh, – I'm doing fine. Let's uh let's get ready to talk cards. And I have a feeling that this week we're gonna need some help from our viewers in the terms of calling in. So we're kind of running dry on topics to talk about. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll 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 fill in the time. I'm pretty sure we'll be yeah. able to do that. I think we, got, we can we... kill an hour, but we can use some help. We can well good luck to your team tonight. Hope you enjoy yeah. that your evening there. Um, all right. Well, we've got we do have Brad in the crowd, of course. He's out garage sailing this morning. Cardboard Max is with us. Good morning, guys. Great to see you. So, uh, the first topic we were going to talk about was basically uh, just filling everybody in on uh, and the action around the card shows this this month here in May. We've got uh, we've got a bunch of things going on. We got a couple uh, card shows happening uh, at various locations in the country at the same time. So. Uh, Drew, which card yeah. shows are you attending this uh, this month here in May? Uh, well, the Dallas show, which which a lot of us at Hobby Hotline will be at. Um, will be I'll be going to that one. And um, I I wish I could have gone this weekend because the guy that I work with here, he's attending three different ones in three different states this weekend. So that kind of tells you how busy it is. And that's not and that's not even going to the Miami show, which is one of the bigger shows. So I mean, there's. There are so many shows starting back up. I love seeing it. Um, the the North Carolina schedule is getting filled back up, but just even outside, I mean, three shows within five hours for a drive, you know, all weekend. That's what he did all weekend. It's great. I love it. Chris, you mentioned you're going to the Chantilly show. What are you looking yeah, forward to? I, I think you and I, Jeremy, we're like the only two members of the Hobby Hotline crew that aren't going to that big show in Texas. <laughs> But that same weekend, there is the the Chantilly show is running again. Uh, it's actually delayed from last month, but uh, yeah. I will be there that Saturday. And maybe if I get a ticket for the morning session, uh, I might call in to, uh, and maybe we might have two there cards you go. from two card shows. So, yeah, uh, there you go. Um, there you go. Chantilly is one of the better card shows on the yeah. East Coast. Uh, if you're within driving distance from Washington, D.C., or if you can get a cheap flight into Dulles Airport uh, and you're jonesing for a big, the big card show experience, yeah. come on down to, to – and, and, and if you're not going to the Dallas show, come on down to Chantilly. You'll have a great time. Uh, no, Chantilly's great. That's uh, relatively close for me. Not, not too far at all of a drive. I've been there a couple of times. It's a wonderful show. Um, I – I, I had planned on going last month. That's why, you know, Dallas was booked this month, then they moved it to the same week and you know, is what it is. You gotta make decisions. But uh and then we've we've got that new show, the Wisconsin Dells show. I see yeah. a lot of people talking about that. That and uh the promoter of that, Grant Slayton, I believe, he's been posting on Instagram whenever a new uh a new vendor signs up, he's kind of saying, Hey, this this person's gonna be setting up, that person's setting up. So creating a lot of hype which i think is great and uh another show that i'd love to be able to attend but seeing as i'm up in canada you know i go down there i come back up to come back home i have to quarantine for two weeks so can't afford to do that yeah. so unfortunately I, I gotta be i'm alienated from all the show activity down in the, in the u.s but uh, i'm envious of you guys and hope you, you all enjoy it and that they're they're all very successful i'm sure they will be yeah, I I would assume that most are most are going to be. Um, I know a lot of people have been dying to get out. I know a lot of I I deal with a lot of the people that set up at least at a lot of the shows in North Carolina, and even a lot of people that were hesitant to go a while back are starting to set back up, starting to get back into their normal routine. So it's awesome. Yakov asking about San Jose or San Fran. I 
I know they do have some Yakov. I'm just not familiar with exactly uh, when they are to a T. I know that um, the guys over at Wax Pack are putting something out that you'll be able to find all the card shows around the country here really soon. Um, but I don't. I, I, I'm not familiar with exactly that area that well, but I know there are some, but yeah, as Jason says, Jacksonville has a big one. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a ton of, them. it's awesome. Yeah. One, one, uh, one resource that I like to use is, uh, is Beckett.com. They have a, a yeah. list of card shows. That's pretty well updated every week. So I think it's just nice with, with all the card shows coming back and everything. Um, that you know you get you get that whole hobby community back together like in a couple of weeks i mean i've i've met a lot of the people that in this through the national and everything but i haven't met everyone that's done hobby hotline you know so, in, in person yet so i mean none of us have met in person unfortunately y'all won't be at the dallas show but it's just nice to be able to go to those shows because i mean let's face it no matter what i mean i'm i'm meeting people from my hometown now and i live in a very small town in groups from cards and people that I didn't even know in this really tiny town that I live in. So, you know, it's just good for the community. I think to finally get some stuff out, you start to see a lot more, I'm seeing a lot more trading happening right now. And I think that has a lot to do also with card shows. I'm seeing a lot of people with their coming home from card shows with their trade halls. So I, you know, I think that maybe one area when a lot of money was flowing into the hobby and everything that kind of was put on the back burner with a lot of people was just good, a good old fashioned trade. Yeah. But you um, mentioned Drew, you mentioned community just now. Yeah. So, you know, and I know we were chatting about a few topics and um, I just wanted to mention, you know, there's a lot of, there's lots of platforms out there. You know, we've obviously got Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, all, all the content out there. Uh, the clubhouse yeah. app has really started to take off. I'm on there quite a bit uh, talking hobby with, various hobbyists it's been great for networking and really expanding uh the reach just the region and making more hobby friends and contacts it's been pretty awesome but then there's also these new uh platforms uh, new-ish platforms for for yeah. breaking and and selling cards uh we've got loop the app we've got uh whatnot um what you know in terms of group breaking and where it's yeah. happening you know it's it's always it seems to be very popular on facebook instagram even some youtube channels um what do you see happening drew in terms of that activity moving you know starting to move off of those platforms yeah. and onto these new ones that are really specific to uh card sales and breaking well you know I, I actually just interviewed uh, Eric Doty. He'll be on the next episode of Loaming at That Potograph that comes out this week. He's the he works. For, he's the CEO of Loop, one of those apps. And um, I've I've looked into a lot of them, and I love them. I think they're great. I think they're wonderful, and it's something that I always thought would be awesome to do, and thought would be uh, awesome to to be able to have. But I never thought it would catch on until this hobby explosion. I think now was the perfect time for these to come out. I think before you, it would be hard to sway people because you're you're really moving from, let's face it, the, the basic style of breaking is restream OBS and then putting out on YouTube, Facebook, you know, multiple platforms at once and implementing those into groups, everything like that. And now you're taking it and moving it to a specific platform. So it's gonna be very interesting in terms of group activity on Facebook to YouTube streams. I mean, there's a lot of very, I've watched on whatnot. I downloaded the app a couple weeks ago and I have, I haven't bought anything on there, but I watch a lot of the live feeds to <laughs> see if money's moving and it's flying. I mean, there are, it is legitimate. I mean, you go on there at nighttime and it's just one break after another, just filling. It's yeah. Awesome. And I, I've uh, I also had Eric on for Eric Doty from Loop on my show and I I really enjoyed it ha having him he's he's a he's a real uh you know innovator if you will yeah. he's uh, the the goal for him was to make and I loved how he put it because he comes from the video game industry and yep. he said that he wants every time you touch a button every time you 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 interact with your device it should be fun just yes. like you know that's a video game mantra I guess every yes. button you push should be fun I, I wasn't aware of that. And I thought that that was a really cool way to drive the the user experience uh, on the app. 
So I'm excited about that. Um, and you know, there's there are a couple of players in the space that you just, that we just mentioned, yeah. and similar to the way on this show we can push out this video, this show today to Facebook, to YouTube, to Twitch, to Twitter, yeah. wherever we want. Really, I wonder if eventually. Um, you'll be able to push out your your group break um, or, or your, your sales show to more than one of these sort of sort of um, apps, like maybe to, to two at the same time. But they do integrate payments, so that that might be that might be difficult, I suppose. Um, Chris, did you want you wanted to show the the Beck yeah, account? Uh, we had a question in the chat from a guy named Yakov, mm -hmm. and he wanted to know where on Beckett.com. The uh, schedule, ske the, the show scheduled list is. So if you can show this, um, there we go. It's right here. It's Beckett.com slash venue underscore manager. And if you scroll down, you can then filter by state, start date, and it will give you a list of card shows by date yeah. in your yeah. area. Cool. There, yes, so. definitely check it out, Yakov, because there's a lot that are going on right now. I mean, there there's a ton going on throughout the entire country, so I would definitely check it out. You'll be able to uh, find and one. It's pretty well on. updated too. Yeah, so. that's great. Just about every show promoter uh, sends their shows into Beckett. So yeah, and they've been doing that for even uh, that's for been years. going on for years and years. I want to bring up here's a here's a comment I want to speak to and get your guys' opinion from Jason. He says I like smaller shows. I think you get better deals. And what I think of is that some of these bigger shows, you know, the Dallas one that I've seen a lot of uh, content on, on YouTube and Instagram. I wonder if at these shows, is it more, is it a, is a lot of it people, and I haven't been, so I'm asking the question, is a lot of it people kind of just displaying their super high end or their, their yeah. the, the, co the collections they're very proud of? How many, what percentage of booths at these new bigger shows are actual showcases of of like you know just um sharing their collections versus how many are how many what percent are really there to sell cards uh do you have a feel for that yeah um i mean there's there's i agree with at smaller shows you can definitely find some better deals i think um and please guys remember to call in and join the show i just put it put the link in the chat uh if you guys got any questions or comments please call in we'd love to have you on but, um, you know, I, I don't know. It, at the big shows, there's definitely tons of money flying. I mean, there's sales going on like crazy. There are deals to be found at every show, I think. Um, the bigger shows, you might... I, I've always found that the bigger shows I go to the last day, Sunday is normally the best time to find the deals. Um, when people are closing up, there's normally stuff they either don't want to bring home. There's stuff they, you know, they went there to get rid of. But, you can find a lot better deals on those later days, but yeah, some of the small shows, they just don't get the traffic. And so people want to have the, they need their sales, you know, they, they need to make something. And so a lot of times you will get better deals because you'll see people say, well, yeah, you know, they just, they'll bite the bullet, take a little less because you know, they need to make some money. But um, I mean, at the big shows, you definitely see some massive cards but you can see those at the small shows too i mean my buddy Mark mart sets up and i mean at any small show you can find and he's got you know ridiculous cards that are out there but then he's also got dollar boxes and you'll find tons of people that go there solely with those dollar boxes and 50 cent boxes and set up hundreds of tables of those you know i mean they yeah. I wonder if, you know, you mentioned that Sunday is the best day for deals. And I agree. It's traditionally that's always been the best, uh, the best day for deals. However, with the just the rise of the hobby, you know, if you want to get a card, if there's a card you're looking for, I think I think you have to buy it when you see it. You know, you, you yeah. can't go in, walk the room, look for the four or five cards you want, decide which no. one you want to buy, go back. And by the time you go back to buy the one you decide on, Chances are it's going to be gone unless it's, it's a, gone. a very common card, you know. Where yeah, if you, if you find the, the second one, if you find the second one, just turn to the table next to you and sell something real quick and then buy that one. Like <laughs> you yeah. got to carry something with you and you definitely can't pass it up because if there's deals there, people are going to find them and they're going to go. And I know that because I set up at a lot of shows and I will put a couple of deals out on the table on purpose and they go instantly. I mean, it first one or two people at the table, they're going to find the stuff they want. 
And rare card. Same thing with a rare card. You know, if there's a rare card you want, don't expect that it'll be there. No. there, there there's going to be a ton of Carl Yastrzemski rookies in the room, but are that? But how yeah. many? How many? You know, low serial numbered cards that uh, of of whomever that you need for your player collection, your set, whatever it is. Uh, even if it's yeah. just something shiny you really like, you know, you see something you want, I, you, you're going to have to buy it early. Uh, it's been the case a lot when, I, when I've been set up at shows where people come, they come to the booth, they they say, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to come back for that. I'm going to see what else I just got here. I haven't, I got to do a, I got to do a, the circuit first. I'll, I got to do a lap. I'll come back. They come back. Where was that card? Oh man, it's sold. Sorry. You know, and that yeah. was before the pandemic. That was before the rise of the hobby. So I think people need to need, need to kind of act when you see it. When you see a card you need, you kind of got to buy it these days. And of course, just try and get the best deal you can. Yep. All right, we've got a couple of comments uh, coming in. Uh, lots of stuff about the shows, but uh, we've had one comment uh, about you know who's buying top stock. Another comment here uh, from Jason about the let's talk about all the new grading companies coming in. Uh, uh, anybody want? Any yeah. either of those topics you want to touch on, Drew? Yeah, or absolutely. Let's talk some fly by night grading, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I knew you'd want to talk about it. Um, I mean, I'm assuming I don't even know the name. I, oh, yes, I do. I remember it now because they ripped off Kobe's nickname, Black Mamba Grading. Um, one of the one of the new great. Yes, I, I see Is that you an guys' can, name. Yes. Black Mamba? Yeah. Black Mamba no, Grading. Dead serious. It is a real. I mean, it's they're. There are all these new companies coming out, Black Mamba grading, and then there's even some that are just doing raw card reviews and literally just assessing a card, sealing it, charging a premium. Like, I mean, I, I do card assessing, but it's like built into a grading price. Like it's not, you know, a, like a big service or anything like that or guaranteeing, but you've got so many of these either encapsulation services or uh raw card reviews i've seen multiple of those come up now um and i i don't know i think it's a joke but i mean it, it, a lot of people that are new in the hobby are getting these ads because i clicked on one and my facebook feed now is filled with sponsored ads talking about all of these different companies that's the only reason i know about it is because i clicked on black mom because i thought it was a joke and it wasn't it was a real company and oh there's literally about 20 or 30 now. Well, there's a lot of new people that I see people taking screenshots saying, hey, are these people legit? Well, thank God they asked the question. But how many people don't ask the question, you know? And I mean, yeah. some of these companies actually have some very reputable people in the hobby backing them. And I don't understand it. I, I really don't understand it because it's, it's blatantly obvious to me what it is. Well, let, let me let me give you my my, my short, short, maybe not so short, but my thoughts on this, uh, guys. You know, um, I don't. It doesn't matter to me who's backing you. I don't care how high profile of a backer you are. The only thing that matters to me with a, within any grading company, including the the incumbents, is who are the graders and yeah. what qualifications do they have that enable them to num to to very importantly authenticate the card first yeah. of all the card needs to be authenticated and the grade needs to be assessed so if i'm a new company and if i'm going to open up a new grading company or if i'm going to consider a new grading company the very first thing i'm going to do is i'm not going to i'm not going to flaunt a fancy slab or a fancy colorful label i'm not going to talk about ai that i may or may not be using and i'm going to talk about who the people are that are grading the cards who, who are the graders and what is their resume that enables them to be able to authenticate the card and assess the grade? What is their experience? What have they done in the hobby? That's what I'm going to flaunt if I'm, and I'm not starting a grading company, but if I was, <laughs> I would be flexing what the experiences of the graders are and how do I, how can you, my potential customer, trust that they can authenticate and grade my card accurately and consistently? Doesn't matter who's back in the business. That that's irrelevant right. to me. I mean, it's important for longevity and that you can sustain and have some working capital. That's definitely important. But all I care about as a customer is who's grading these cards and and why should I trust them to grade and authenticate? What do you guys? Well, think? and that's and well, that I completely agree with you. And that's what these all of these companies, if you look at it, they don't try <laughs> and actually 
they don't try and convince you that they're grading superior. They just try and fancily word why you should encapsulate your card. You know what I mean? It's just they're they're beating around the actual why a grade is important and what grading truly is just trying to grab your money real quick. I mean, that's that's all this stuff is. It's a complete total money grab. And it's I mean, I, I understand seeing an opening and wanting to do something, but there's no there's no experts involved in this, at least that are that they're flaunting or talking about any of these companies. There's no there's no method to a process or anything. They just fancily word a couple of posts, put it out there and apparently have gotten enough. I mean, some of these pages have a couple hundred followers and actually are getting business. And it, it's mind blowing to me. I, I just. <laughs> so the feds come knocking on their door. Yeah. I mean, hey, that could that could be happening. There's a lot. Uh, well, they're, they're there's probably a lot looking into grading right now. If they're setting them up as legitimate businesses. You know, the feds are. There's no reason to come knocking in unless there is crime going on. I, I would think. But uh, but Chris, well, you wanted to jump in there. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted. You know, history tends to repeat itself, right? And during the last, the first great grading boom in the hobby in the late 90s and early 2000s. There were also a number of fly-by-night grading companies that popped up and were gone within a few years. And, and you go to card shows and you still see these slabs from some of these companies, you know? There's, I remember ASA, Pro Grading, USA Grading. And there was a company about 20 years ago called GAI, and you still yeah. kind of see their slabs come up pop up. Um, they were actually founded by a bunch of former PSA employees, mm -hmm. but um, they didn't make it. So that yeah. may be a lesson for some of these new grading companies out there that uh, yeah. are yeah. Yeah. popping up now. Yeah. I mean, you may even have, you may be like CSG and poach a bunch of former BGS employees. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stick around. Well, right. uh, the, the reason why PSA, SGC, and BGS have survived for 20, 25, 30 years is reputation. Yeah, and that's not I mean, easy to acquire overnight. Well, so and to I mean, me, I, it's important where, you know, it's important to me that the, the graders are, um, like you said, the GAI guys were a bunch of old PSA guys. That's going to give me faith in their grading and authentic authentication ability. Uh, Rex Rex makes a good point. He says, you know, what sort of resume can any of these new uh, graders have? Well, they can't, but they can be trained by people with resumes. And exactly. that, that's the important thing, right? So I'm okay with PSA and Beckett hiring up, staffing up. And they've said on many uh, on many platforms and shows that, you know, of course, it takes time. They can't just hire people off the street and then all of a sudden they're churning out slabs. They need to take time to grade them and make sure they can do it. So I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is a brand new company yeah. and a couple of buddies putting a business together and saying, hey, we are now graders and authenticators. Who trained you? That's, right. that's what it comes down to, right? Yep. Drew? Do you even no, have any knowledge of how the hobby works? Yes. That's another it, thing, too. Exactly. Oh, that's very important because there are a lot of people that are. You know the difference the between, like, I don't know, a regular Topps Chrome card and a refractor. Yeah. Right. So yeah. to Rex's yeah. point again, yeah, where does it leave us? It leaves us at the point where people can be trained. They just need yeah. they need to be trained and they need to be trained by experts and people with experience. So yeah. that doesn't concern me. It's just a time issue. And that's why, you know, that's yes. why. PSA can hire 150 people, but those 150 people aren't going to be able to grade the day six after they're hired or even two weeks. It's going to take a couple months. months. Yeah, six. six months even, right. Which is which gives me confidence that yes. they are making sure that they know what they're doing if, it exactly. does, if they do spend that much time. And another yep. thing too is that I think this is uh, with BGS. I'm not sure if it's with PSA, but if you take a job with BGS – you can no longer buy or sell BGS graded cards. And for a lot of people that would make good graders, they're mostly dealers and collectors mm -hmm. who buy and sell these cards. So if you're making a lot of money right now, buying and selling graded cards, why would you give that up to 
take a job as a card grader. Oh, no trust me, man. Don't do that anymore. That's one of the biggest issues that, that they have is that the pay yeah, is not. You can't the pay just is hire not a bunch wonderful. of jabronis off the street and teach the them. The pay is not wonderful. The job is not. The job is insanely stressful. And like you said, a lot of people that would be good at this can make a lot more money in the same industry doing something else. Yeah, Peeps makes a really good point that just popped up. At the, you know, I'll throw it on the screen here quick. Uh, you know, it's as a by the, of course by the card, not the grade. I think that's yeah. common sense now. But he goes on to say, you need to know, you need to as a hobbyist, and I know not everybody can because we all come in the hobby at a different point in time, and we take time. It takes time to get up to speed, but it's just so important now to get up to speed as quick as you can when you are purchasing a card. So. Really, you know what? What a lot of people will do is, let's say you're in the in the, and I'll use uh, the Wayne Gretzky rookie card as an example. Let's say you're in the market to purchase an OPG Wayne Gretzky rookie card. When you go to a card show, if that's where you're going to buy it, take some, find a common card from the set, take it with you, so you can compare the card stock, the cut, you know, all, all the, the the surface, the different features of the card. Really, really smart point by Peeps to, uh, you know, that just to remind us to get as educated as you can yourself because how yes. can we trust a lot of these fly uh, we're, we're, what we're calling fly by night grading companies and some of them will be fly so by night yes. they are what they are for now the cream yeah. will rise to the top though right some some yeah, will yeah. some i won't i won't say some will probably be last but perhaps yeah. some will last perhaps some will last just we not a, one commenter said, "Bring back SCD grading. Jesus. Yeah, bring back the white glove treatment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, do you guys want to? You want to move along? We've got. We can sure. talk about the top stock, the MUDS uh, ticker. We can talk about the golden sure. auction preview that just came out a couple of days ago. That auction launches tomorrow. I, I was flipping through it. There's uh, just shy, I see just shy of three thousand lots there. Very Kobe heavy." Uh, perhaps with the induction coming up soon. We have the NFL draft that just took place. Drew, Drew, Chris, what do you guys want to touch on first? Well, how, I mean, how about if we get a caller in and tell them, yeah. and have them ask us what they want to talk about? Do we yeah, have a give us a call. I put the give link us a in the call. chat. But the, I'm looking at the golden auction stuff, and I mean they've got some nice stuff in there. It is very Kobe heavy. I am. I'm not. I guess I'm not that surprised at it, but it is. Uh, Pretty Kobe heavy. There's some nice stuff there's, on there. There's a bit of everything. There, they've got yeah. a Magic Johnson, Larry Bird uh, rookie PSA ten. That's a pop twenty four. You don't see that very often. No, <laughs> that's going to be great to see. You've got you got the PMG red, both a Jordan and a and a Kobe Bryant. All sorts of Pele cards. All sorts of Jackie Robinsons, Mickey Mantles. Of course, it's a beautiful auction. I and I, a T two hundred six. T two hundred six. Yeah, Lot number T one. Yeah, it's I awesome. Believe it's a, I believe it's a PSA too. Yep. Yeah, so it is. If the chat wants to let us know about what other topics we that you want us to touch on first, otherwise, I think we we're gonna have to take the bull by the horns here, guys, and jump into something ourselves. Um. Well, GT Black asks, uh, "How close do you think advanced technology is to resolving the problem of not enough graders?" Um. I'm gonna, I I'll touch on that for a minute. I mean, I think I think stuff like the PSA buyout of Genement and companies like that, those little small processes, you're never, I don't think we should ever see it. And we kind of talked, touched on this um, a little while ago when we talked about the whole AI aspect, but I don't think you ever see it go full AI. And I don't know if you'd necessarily want it to. Um, the The biggest problem is the card companies don't provide a perfect, uh, the company is an example of what a perfect card is. So they're all judging what a perfect, everything is completely judged, you know, subjective right off the bat because there's no display of what an actual perfect card is. Um, and so, I mean, any of these little bits and pieces that can knock off processing or can maybe help tell if the card has been pressed or if edges have been, you know, if stuff has been altered right away, anything that can cut the, the, pr the process down and the time down, I think that's what's going to ultimately help. But it's also people are just going to have to be patient and wait. And yeah. I think, I mean, I've I've adapted and changed my subbing philosophy of what I would send with the price increases. And I know a lot of other people have. And so, I mean, I think you just, it is what it is. You know what it is now. I mean, everybody does. You should not be surprised whatsoever. But yeah. uh, I, don't think it, I don't think it'll ever 
solve the problem of not enough graders. I don't think technology will do that much in grading. But I think it'll. Oh, go ahead, Chris. I'm going to go. You go ahead, Jerry. Well, I was going to say I, I think that uh, with with PSA acquiring the Genement technology, which of course you know I've seen what everyone else has seen, a bit of a, a display or a bit of a preview of what it does. The thing I like the most about it is the uh, the fingerprinting that it can do yes. to, to tell each copy of a card apart. Uh, that to me is is very important. It should it should reduce the the the, the amount of resubs, people looking for bumps on cards, that sort of thing. I think that's great. The other thing I think is that you know if any company is poised to, to do it, it's going to be PSA just with the way yeah. they're capitalized, uh, with their leadership the uh the tech the technical the tech the way that nat turner is a tech guy I yes mean, he's not going to buy gentleman unless he thinks it's going to help his his new company so big time i have a lot of faith now i'm with you drew i don't think that that technology is going to replace the human grader but what i do like is that and what i hope happens is that they put the cards through the gentleman process and then a human yeah. kind of confirms corroborates yes. what the machine is saying that way the human only has to spend you know you can look at a card okay you know at, at a at a quick at a quick glance maybe under a magnification maybe there's a process there and they just say yep check the box the card goes off to slabbing and right. then all sorts of automation that they can implement that move the card like literally yes. moves the card from the from the assessment to the slabbing you know, the label printing to shipping, to packaging yes. and shipping. That's where robotics Thank and automation you. helps. You're not going to see it. Drew, we're on the same page. No yes. one's, no machine is going to handle the whole process. I don't think that's ever going to happen, but it can certainly save a lot of time. So, uh, and how, how, how close are we there uh, to GT Black's comment? I mean, we're closer than we've ever been because yes. PSA acquired gentlemen. And you, yes. you have to think that, Nat and and the team at PSA, but specifically probably Nat, are going to help Genement become better than it already is. Well, when I talked to the owner um, of Genement, and now he's a PSA executive uh, on the show a couple of weeks ago, he was explaining this whole process and everything. And the idea is to build off of that. So you know, they're only going his whole, uh, really whole idea and job there is to build up that platform and expand its capabilities of what it can do and make it better but what you said nailed it it's the processing if they can get the processing of the cards the actual movement of the cards that's what the hold up is it's not always that there's not enough people to grade them it's the actual processing and the system that's set up but like you said you've got a company now which is why i we talked about it right when it happened i loved the nat buy and I love the people that was in the company with him that bought it because they're all from the tech space. They all have handled companies with stuff like this, with uh, at, with revenue and um, amount of demand that they have now. And so I'm with you. I think PSA is the one that's probably going to do it. And I think stuff like this, Genement companies like this, I think these little pieces which I thought was a brilliant move by Nat was taking something that hadn't even come to the market yet, but was coming to the market and finding a way to implement it into the grading process. I mean, I th that's brilliant. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. Master Damus uh, puts a comment saying, you know, what if you have a nine with edges that can be cleaned up to make a gem? I mean, you know, that that's where the human element might come in, you know, understanding what a card looked like out of the pack. So again, it's not going to be completely technology based. I don't. I don't believe yeah. it can be, and and that's where that's where the human experience and the human element, I think, needs to come into play. Uh, Peeps have, throws a question in there quickly. Uh, have you had an issue with the really old slabs' physical qualities changing over time? Uh, I I haven't. Uh, just to throw it up there, I haven't had that issue uh, with any of my slabs. But I I keep my slabs out of the light. I pretty yeah. much all you know. They they may sit on the desk for a couple of weeks here and there. Go to a couple card shows and be in your showcase for a few hours a day, but in general, my slobs are in the dark. So I haven't had that issue uh, before. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've seen cards that are even on display all the time that I've, I haven't seen any issue with. And I mean, even, I mean, the one thing I have seen is some of the old refractors 
from like 96 to about 2000 before they really perfected that technology, which I guess we haven't seen how perfected it is because some of these aren't 20 years old yet, but you do see some of the, the hulking or the greening of some of those refractors. And that can happen even if the card's encased, but that's not the slab. That's the card. As far as a slab or a label, I don't, you know, I don't know, but that is, that's a great question, racing card info. And the, uh, will the new slabs after the AI be worth more than older ones? Um, I think that kind of is going to fall on the individual buyer personally. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's going to depend on whether or not, uh, this, this becomes accepted by collectors. Right. So I think it's a great question too. Um, and I, I think that I, I do believe again, coming back to the leadership at PSA, who I have a lot of faith in the new leadership. I have a lot of faith in it. I think that they are going to be considering all these things and I don't know that it's under their control, but to the extent that they can influence that, I think they're going to, they're not going to want to damage any of the historical slab uh, values or comparatively speaking. And, you know, again, if a human is the final determiner of a grade on a card, even in the future, the human was also the final determiner of a grade in the past. So to me, the finger Printing is the most important thing. Not the most important thing. Uh, I mean, the fingerprint table. The... Are we losing Jerry? Is everything okay? I yeah. think we kind of lost, lost it there for about seconds. 10 or 15 seconds. Yeah. Oh, wow. So okay. You can rewind. Sorry, I was just saying, I think that the, I think that with, uh, with the population reports are going to become more stable because... Yes. You're not going to see more resubs, more people looking for bumps, that kind of thing. And that's a good thing. So that shouldn't hurt the old, the historical slabs. And uh, if you heard what I was saying before, I just, you know, I don't, I, I think that with a human, a human used to have the final say on a card grade. And in the future, I believe a human will still have the final say on a card grade. So the process changes, but um, I don't see why it would damn it. It would hurt old, older slab yeah. values. There's been a lot of talk about, PSA bringing on a new grade, whether it's a, a you know right. something similar to a, a black label BGS ten or adding in a PSA nine point five. It's all Ugh. speculation. Nobody knows know. for sure uh, at this point in time, except for maybe Nat Turner. Yeah, right. So you know we could go there too. Is what what does that do? But uh, because we don't know if it's happening, we're we're just kind of uh, waxing poetic at that point i don't know if it's worth worth uh, worth the time we're, we're we got about 20 minutes left what do you guys think oh i mean that is i hope they don't um personally just because i think that if you want to talk about devaluing stuff i think bringing in new grades is a wonderful way to devalue your old grading process so that is something i would probably not do and i don't think Nat would do that i had not heard that um and that would be to me, that that's just something that I w- I wouldn't do. But you know, well, yeah, Ken Golden, I had him on my show on I think it was April 11th or something, and uh, we chatted for a while, and he alluded to it some, and so people okay. thought that maybe maybe he had some information, but I sure. don't believe he did. No. Um, and you know, so it's a great question for for Nat, of course. Yeah. And um, personally, I'm with you, Drew. I don't think they're, I don't think they will do it because I think that it will, if they were to bring in a PSA 10 pristine or, you know, a (laughs) PSA 11, let's call it just for sake of discussion, what does that do to all the other PSA 10s? Well, it potentially hurts them or it causes everybody to send their PSA 10s in for a potential bump, exactly, which which people will call a cash grab, but really they don't need a cash, PSA does not need a cash grab. PSA- PSA has no issues uh, w- with cash flow and uh, and revenue. So, you know, they're already at max capacity. They're way past max capacity. Yeah. So I don't know that they that they want to do. And bringing in the AI reduces the, yeah. the the chance that people are going to send in cards for a regrade. So that that's the opposite of a cash grab. So <laughs> they may balance, yeah. uh, balance each other off, but yeah. No, we'll I, yeah, I mean, I think that's the the best part is the uh, the stopping of the resubbing and everything. I mean, you could no, uh, I mean, you can still get something from Beckett or from SGC or HGA or any of these companies and crack those and send them, but you can only send them once, and we're no longer going to have 
like the Russell Wilson contenders auto where there's 23 copies, but like uh 36 graded, you know, so. <laughs> exactly. Let's throw up the, uh, the Colin uh, information again. I'm here. We go put, put that up there. If any, if we, anyone wants to call in, throw in a topic, join the discussion, please do. It's always fun for us when somebody calls in and, uh, Hey, Join awesome, the- Logan. Logan, can't wait, man. Make sure to stop by Hobby Hotline uh, if you come to if uh, you're at the show on Saturday, man. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm super disappointed. I'm not going to be able to be there uh, at the Dallas show. We are going to have just about every uh, Hobby Hotline host there, I think, except for Chris and I uh, will be yeah. there. Uh, is that that's the May 22nd weekend, I believe. Yep. And yep. Uh, so I know that uh, at Rich Klein's booth. A lot of the guys will be hanging out, uh, and I believe you're going to be doing a show live from the da- the Hobby Hotline that weekend. Will be live from the Dallas show. I'll be watching in with envy that I can't be there <laughs> physically, but uh, really looking forward to that. Yeah, guys, if you if you are going to be there, uh, I'll go on and do it right now. But if you are going to be there at the show, please stop by when we do the live show. We'd love to have you guys. Um, on the show rich will probably just grab you and pull you on anyway so uh you know be prepared if you do walk up but we'd love to have you guys on the show um and we'll be there all weekend uh rich is set up i'll be there networking all weekend long um i know dr beckett john newman bunch of people brad uh who's in the chat right now i know a whole lot of people will be down there so definitely stop by the booth uh rich i'm sure um probably next week we'll be able to give an update on when where exactly his booth is but uh yeah rich definitely hit us up looking forward to it logan that's awesome man rich is going to be in all of his glory hosting yes. everybody at his booth and, <laughs> and, and having fun all right we we have a call in right now let's just take the, yeah. the comment off let's bring in brad texas card dude brad what's going on what's up man what's up everybody what? I'm at, we're doing the, the garage sale and it's kind of quiet so i thought i'd uh Hop on and say, what's up? I'm actually watching. My wife and I are, are commenting, and we're aggravating Chris Harris off the fly. So it's all good good stuff. And uh, just wanted to say I'm glad that uh, Drew's uh, online, and I hope Jude, Jude hits a home run later. Appreciate it, bud. <laughs> good to see you, Brad. Good luck at the, good luck at the, uh, at the garage sale. I wonder if you're selling any awesome old uh, baseball cards or anything like that. No, but I'm – bobbleheads though so <laughs> clearing out space right on right on nice. thanks for th- th- good to see you buddy good thanks for calling in on, on, a, on a day off yeah so we had uh racing card info to put up top stock uh why yeah. don't we talk on that a little bit because i know it's pretty Woo-hoo. exciting that we can now actually purchase shares of, of tops or what will eventually become tops i, I actually bought a few shares a couple of weeks ago of the uh the murdoch capital Acquisition Corp, M-U-D-S on the ticker. And uh, I pulled it up just now. I think I got in for about twelve fifty a share. And now I see it closed on Friday at $16.13. And $13. Yeah, I got in at 10. I, I forget exactly. I think it was like 10.16 or 10.23. I got it. I bought it the second that I saw the announcement. I was like, yep, I, I know that the, the hobby, there's no way there's too many people putting money into it. It's a the stock is a guarantee in my eyes. I mean, especially when I look at everything else they've got going on, that's going good. And I mean, I don't want to shift the focus away from it, but their NFT market soaring, their online digital sales tops now hitting all time records, project 70 all time records. I mean, anything they're doing right now, they're knocking it out of the park. So I I expect that thing to go up and up and up. Yeah, and now I was going to ask, I was going to put it out to you guys, like, why why are you buying it, you know, and I think you just answered that, Drew. Chris, have you bought any? I have not bought any. Not so yet. why haven't you bought? Let's ask that question. Why not? What's <laughs> holding you back? Uh, I don't know. Just haven't gotten around to it yet. Not really. I haven't gotten around to it. So I, I oh. bought a few shares, again, just because I had some, I had a little bit of cash in one of my investment accounts. I thought, you know what? Right. I'm a hobbyist. I've been a hobbyist for 40 years. I, I believe in the hobby. I I always have. Uh, now it seems like a lot of a lot of people do too. Uh, a lot more people do too. And I thought, you know what? Um, it's an opportunity where we can no longer buy a collector's universe and get in on at that level, of the, which I think is obviously would have been a, another great investment. Uh, Nat Turner agrees. 
Um, so I bought I bought the shares uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I want to have a I want to have some skin in the game that way. I didn't put a lot of money in, but I thought you know what? it just it gets you in, and then it also gets you access to their annual report. Uh, a night, hopefully a night. Not that you can't read that publicly anyway, but. You know, I bought a share of Berkshire Hathaway B stock back in like 2003, right. and since then, every year, it just came, it just came this week. I get I get the Warren Buffett annual report. I read I read his letter to the shareholders every year, and it's kind of fun. It's just it's just a nice thing to add. And in a way, as a you know, as a collector, we're all collectors. I collect those annual reports. I have every single one going back to that first year, and I'm looking forward to uh, as long as tops. Or Murdoch Capital, whatever they end up calling the, the the parent company, as long as they they do end up putting out a, a hard copy with a nice cover, I'm going to collect those annual reports. I know it sounds silly, but at the same time, it's really just a freebie along with being able to to ride the stock as well and have some skin in the in the hobby. So those yeah. were kind of my reasons for for purchasing it. Yeah, and and just with the way the the way the hobby's going. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a poor investment. I think it's gonna. I think it will pay off uh, in the long run. Any thoughts on this, guys? I completely agree. I think it's gonna keep going up for quite some time. I think you're gonna see a major bump, especially when you see it change over to TOPP uh, when it does later on in the in the year, probably closer to like October, November. Um, I mean, I, I like you said, the hobby. I think there's too many people. There's too many people now, especially in the hobby, that came from the stock industry that came from hedge funds that came from all of this. I, I just don't see this as something where it's going to fail like it did in the past. I don't think it's going to go. I'm not saying it's going to be Amazon or Tesla or Apple or, you know, or something like that. But I think it from something that was at $10 when it was initially announced, it's an incredible buy. I mean, I could see it easily go to 50, 60. But Drew, you know, you said you don't see it being the next Tesla or, or Apple or whatever. But let let's let's look at it this way. You 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 mentioned the NFTs, their online their online products. You know, yeah, NFTs are still in their infancy. It's basically a concept yeah. that the general public wasn't even aware of until 2021, believe it right. or not. And if that is going to be uh, a technology that's going to become similar to the you know as as pervasive as the internet became, yeah that our blockchain has become the you know, blockchain isn't going anywhere maybe it is the next tesla yeah. if or or you know but tesla is kind of alone in its class it seems right. whereas it how hard would it be for panini to do this or for upper deck or for lee for any of the companies to to do something but they're the only one that's publicly traded so until other one other companies become traded it is the only chance you have of getting in on it again if these if this technology takes off maybe it is the next yeah. I don't want to say Tesla because Tesla yeah. trades what fifteen hundred yeah. earnings, but yeah. but uh, but I, I don't know. You know what? For for sixteen bucks a st uh, a share, you want to buy a hundred shares? You get in for sixteen hundred dollars yeah. right now. I mean, that's that's not that much of a risk. That's that, that's not that's a Luca based prism. You I was know? about to say that's buying into like one prism break. I mean, geez, like I, I mean, come on, you can get twenty shares for the the price you can get the Timberwolves in a prison box. So I mean, you know, I'll I'll take a shot every once in a while. Why not? But uh, yeah, that's just me. But anyway, guys, I'm gonna let I am going to let Jeremy and uh, and Chris handle the rest of the show. I've got to go coach some baseball, so I will see you guys uh, here in a couple of weeks. But enjoy the rest of the show and call in. Give these guys a little something more to talk about. Thank Got you, Drew. Yep. Great to see you, buddy. Right. Thank Thanks. you. Take care, man. All right, Chris, it's it's you and me. So, um, you know, there, so, there's a few, there's a bit of conversation going on in the chat right now about uh, what what product drops y'all looking forward to. Of course, uh, I, I do want to go back to oh, uh, right. <laughs> to, to tops. Is that now that they're going to be publicly traded again? Is that one thing that I looked forward to when they were publicly traded? was their SEC filings because you were able to take a peek behind the curtain and uh, we haven't been able to, to get that for the last 13, 14 years. So we may be able to figure out things like uh, production runs for certain products um what, what one other thing that they did public that they were they used to publish was their licensing information mm. 
and uh, we haven't had that in a while. So I'm 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 looking forward to that. I'm 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 with you. The licensing information will be very interesting. See how many years they have left on each uh, property. That 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 is very interesting. In terms of print runs, I mean, I unless I mean, they're going to volunteer that because it's not. Gonna... There are ways that you can calculate print runs now using the info on the back of the wrapper, but yeah, in terms that... of revenue and and there are there's a lot. Kinda... Yeah. Well, under under IFRS reporting, which is uh, not no longer a U.S. GAAP reporting, um, I can tell you that it's it makes no sense. It does not reflect reality, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and revenue, the way revenues are stated, is not based on cash flow. So it's going to be you know yeah. uh, it's going to be next to impossible, I would think, to be able to 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 really parse out the top line revenue, even if they, in their segmented information, if they do have it, even by license, well, now you've got all these products, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult to figure out the print run on any, and on any single product. Uh, but what, like you said, Chris, I do agree. It does give you the ability to peek behind the curtains and see what, see what's going on there. And I think that's, uh, I think that's going to be pretty awesome to, to just, you know, not just the licensing, but a few other topics will 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 come through and give us some uh, some more information there. So it will be it will be interesting, and it will give us. It's really the only, you know, information from any company that that we're gonna get in terms of financial performance, and even if, you know, I'm hoping their segmented their segmented reporting uh, note will be will 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 kind of. Pull the curtain back a little bit further even i think this will probably be the closest that we can get to see how well the hobby as a whole is doing yeah judging by trading card revenue whether it goes up or down each year yeah maybe well, for sure for sure the thing you know back to them just becoming public again what what i'm not sure of, people have asked me you know how do you feel about tops going public what do you think it means for the hobby and my my initial response is because you know I'm a hockey collector. Like I collect all the sports, but I'm probably 50, 60 percent hockey, and then I spread the rest between baseball, football, basketball, and and the other a few other uh, areas. But I my initial response was I'm just glad it's not upper deck that went public because <laughs> when you're public now you're at the mercy of the shareholders, yeah. and the shareholders only care about re reporting about financial reporting, your revenue, your net income, and 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 it's all based on the share. They only care about the share price. Share price is based on re revenues, and revenues are based on sales. So I don't know what it's going to do in terms of um, management's bias towards driving up revenues. How what's that going to do to print runs? Making more products, increasing print runs, all those all those things. Now I we are and aware it's nineteen ninety one all over again. None of the card companies uh, print their own cards. It's all done by third-party vendors, yeah. and that's why we're seeing uh, some delays. Is because the third-party printing vendors, and there's only a few of them, are backed up. They are running the presses 24/7. When someone says that Panini runs the presses on Prism 24/7, well, Panini doesn't run the presses, and that those vendors are also printing for Upper Deck and Tops and Leaf, oh, and geez. so so it's. Uh, I wonder where the hobby could use some more. <laughs> it's kind of a double-edged sword, but the hobby could use more infrastructure in the printing uh, sector. Actual the, the actual manufacturing of the cards. That's where there's a lot of that, that's where there's a lot of backlog going on right now. Yeah. So the way I understand it, it is Cardamundi. They do tops primarily, right? And then this other company that's across the highway from. Rich Klein's office, I forget what it was named. They do primarily Panini and Upper Deck. And I think Cardinal Monday only has maybe one location in the United States, maybe a second, but Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm not mostly sure, in Texas. I just know that they are they are the companies yes, are PC looking packaging is that other company so yeah thanks they're, million they're, cubs they're looking to uh get their cards printed wherever they can right now uh 1 million cubs uh asked did they segment out trading cards in their candy division before 
Well, yes. one thing I can tell you for sure is that accounting standards have completely changed since TOPS was last public and uh, and segmented information is required. I, and um, I think that they will, if it's a unique division of uh, a unique business and a division that they will be segmenting it out. So we will, we will likely see the confectionery uh, versus the trading card. We might even see the trading card versus the NFT uh, or, or the digital uh, the digital product as well. So will they will they combine you know uh, traditional sports card, i.e. packs and cases and boxes from the the uh, the on demand products? Not sure. To me, that's that may not be a distinct and separate business unit. Whereas the the candy production uh, certainly will be. So looking forward to it. But again. What they did before will not have any bearing on what they do now because the counting standards have, have changed uh, quite, dra quite, quite dramatically. So we'll see. We'll see. All right. Um, anything else we want to talk about? NFL yeah. draft? I mean, we, we got a couple three of minutes left. went one, two, three for the first time since the uh, Tim Couch, McNabb, and Achilles Smith draft. I'm, I'm I mean – Football is is a skilled position, rookie skill position drive to hobby. So you got three quarterbacks going one, two, three. Looks like uh, Panini might have a good year this year. Yeah, well, I, I you know, unfortunately, Chris, I am not. Uh, football is the sport that yeah, I follow. Yeah, yeah, I, so I know. I can't jump in too much. I apologize to the to the audience and to the chat that. Uh, that's not something that I'm aware. I know Trevor Lawrence went number one and uh, looking forward to seeing what he brings to the table. Uh, you know, he seems like he could have a pretty solid brand behind him. So now if, if this, if the on field skills match up with his, uh, his, his brand, you could have a real winner there. Now, now there have been a lot of Trevor Lawrence cards that have come out before the draft, such as that box set that tops came out with. I know leaf, revived the pro set brand just to make a and the first card was an on-demand lawrence card um do you think these kinds of pre-draft cards are going to hold their value though because i'm not so sure that they're going to i don't know man i mean card. i do think Ooh. that it depends it's going to come down to what the card looks like how nice is it i think because i'm with you unlicensed cards sometimes don't present well because you've got blank jerseys right they have to airbrush out or photoshop out the the, the logo on the front of the jersey which to me adds a lot of pizzazz to a card it, it adds color it adds design and it identifies the team and the player so it depends um Leaf did show some of the upcoming hockey cards they're going to do on the ProSet brand. They showed them off uh, on on Facebook the other day, and what I really liked what they that, that they were doing was that the the hockey players were kind of off to the side, kind of looking over their shoulder like this, so you couldn't the the front of the so jersey it wasn't, it wasn't there was nothing to not see if you know what I mean. And I thought they were really well done. So photo when you're an unlicensed company and you're putting out an unlicensed product. Photo selection is of paramount importance. And if you just throw a picture up and decide to airbrush out that logo, I think you're you're doing a disservice to, to yourself as a brand and a company and to, to your customers. So, uh, and you know, the whole rookie card definition, theory behind it, I, I mean, I don't know. I think it might be evolving a little bit. So, I th and I think people are, people are now looking to, really buy what they like, what appeals to them, maybe not what the herd is doing. Um, so perhaps they, they perhaps they will maintain some value. It's about all I can think of. All right, yeah. well, we're, we're past the hour mark. Um, I'm going to quickly plug uh, my shows tonight, everybody. The, this evening on Sports Cards Live at 10 o'clock Eastern, I have Andy Albert, who's the owner of the Indy Card Exchange, joining me on my, my early show. Uh, and then... On the late show, I've actually uh, starting at midnight Eastern. Brody the Kid, fellow Hobby Hotline uh, guest host uh, and host, will be joining me for the uh, for my after hour show. So back to and he was just at the Indy Card Exchange in Indianapolis yesterday. So I'm excited to have uh, Andy Albert, the proprietor. We're going to talk about everything to do with uh, running a, an LCS in, in this in today's hobby climate, along with a bunch of other things, and then. Brody and I will be talking hobby for about an hour or so afterwards. So hope to see you all there tonight. 
Chris, anything you want to plug away? Uh, I'll just, I don't have podcast to plug. I don't have any podcast appearances. I don't know, Jeremy, if you're, you're really, really hard up for a guest, you can, I can call you up if you're really that desperate. So, <laughs> um, so someone in the chat wanted to see what you, what Jersey I'm working. Philadelphia Union, MLS. So, um, All right. other than that, follow me on Twitter at stalegum, um, stalegum.com and baseballcardpedia.com. All right, man. Awesome, Chris. All right. Uh, to the chat, everybody, thank you for joining us on this Saturday morning. Always a great way to kick off the Saturday. Peeps, uh, thanks. Good evening to you. We got Sanderson Thor. Yes, buddy. We'll see you tonight. Logan Ward, good evening to you. Or good morning to you, everybody else. Uh, that is going to do it. We are going to sign off. Thanks for joining. And Hobby Hotline will be back next Saturday morning with a brand new panel of hosts. Have a great rest of the weekend, a great week ahead. And hobby on, everybody.